Hi everybody, welcome to IS325's module on defining the region. This is the place where we get to talk to you about what we mean when we say the contemporary Muslim world, why we chose this as the construct for the contemporary Muslim world, and what we hope to accomplish through, through having done so. My name is Bill L. Smith. I'm the director of the Martin Institute and Program in International Studies here at the University of Idaho. And I'm one of the originators of this course back in 2010-2011 when we first put it on the books. Uh, Professor Rafa Chow and I sat down with some colleagues and sketched out what we hope to accomplish. Um, in, in the years since then, Professor Aaron Demont has joined us as one of the key contributors to the class as well. When we did so, when we first sat down, we didn't know exactly what we wanted to, to cover. There were opinions that said that any place there were Muslims, that was the Muslim world. That anywhere there was a country that had a, mo a majority of Muslims, that was the Muslim world. And a few others besides. What we've decided is to really look at the places and peoples and politics of countries that self-define as Muslim. In other words, if they say they're a Muslim country, then we agree they're a Muslim country and we don't have to debate and discuss uh, what exactly we mean. There's some pros and cons to that approach. We'll talk to you about what we are mean as we go along. So before we knew exactly what we were talking about, we knew why we wanted to cover it, why the contemporary Muslim world. So there were three main uh, reasons for that. So one was geostrategic. So geopolitics in, uh, in the decades following the turn of the century suggested that the Muslim world was of importance to us. And that may have been one that was something that was a, a conflict-ridden uh, rationale at first, but it is also a zone of intense cooperation, as we see throughout the class, because it's a complex region, a large geographically complex region, uh, shown here primarily in green, but not uh, solely in green, on this map. And so, if we were in conflict in two of the countries in the region, it didn't mean we were in conflict in all 57 countries in the region. So the geostrategic importance, both positive and negative, so that could mean warfare or it could mean trade and cooperation, was one reason. The second is the sheer size and scope. Um, of the 10 countries in the world with the largest populations, um, seven of them have significant Muslim populations. Five of them, I'm sorry, four of them are here, shown here in green. That would be Indonesia, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Bangladesh. Uh, actually, I think Nigeria is shown here as Christian. It's about 50% uh, Christian, 50% Muslim. Uh, and Russia, India, and, and China all have large Muslim populations as well. And the third reason is just uh, reasons of confusions about uh, of, of the region in the United States, in the Western world. There's a lot of misunderstandings and assumptions made about the region. So we knew that from geostrategic uh, reasons, uh, reasons of confusion and just size and scope that the University of Idaho needed to have a class on the contemporary Muslim world. But again, how to define it was the question. So um, as we uh, debated with our colleagues about what we meant when we uh, were talking about the contemporary Muslim world, we settled on the ones that self-define. So uh, as I said, there's a lot of ways to define it. But in our case, we thought there is an organization, the second largest geopolitical intergovernmental organization in the world. So an intergovernmental organization is one to which governments formerly belong. It's called the Organization of Islamic Cooperation or the OIC. So an intergovernmental organization is a voluntary association of states who, who then say, self-declare that they are Muslim at, at some level and some degree, that they identify as a Muslim state and they're going to cooperate together to try and achieve more collectively on certain, uh, certain topics than they can achieve individually on those topics. Uh, and so because the OIC basically is comprised of states who self-define as Muslim, we decided that in international studies it made some sense to go with that definition as well. So it doesn't mean that we will never talk about Muslims in India. That's the place where the second largest concentration of Muslims is, is in India. But India has even more Hindus than they have Muslims, and they identify as a Hindu state primarily. Uh, China has a very large Muslim population in their west, the Uyghurs. Um, they're not in the organization of Islamic cooperation uh, because they don't self-identify as a, as, as a Muslim state. And there's a few others like this as well. So there are some problems with our definition, but the advantage is it gives us an organizing principle of places that talk about, for example, Muslim concepts of human rights, Muslim concepts of economics, Muslim concepts of of, uh, of equality and uh, fraternity. And so because they do that collectively together, then we can say, here's a way in which we can talk about a complex group of, of Muslim states who are doing something in a unified fashion. 
So the OIC itself isn't a monolith. You'll see that there are uh, subgroups uh, that, that come together in other IGOs as well. Um, so that could be the, the Turkic Council or the West African Economic and Monetary Union or the Arab League. Uh, but they all come together in this parent group called the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. So in this unit, we're going to have you read uh, a profile of what the organization does. You'll see that unlike the United Nations, it doesn't ha cover everything that there are certain things that are left to other intergovernmental organizations to which Muslim states belong. Uh, for example, that could mean that if it's in the Americas and there are a couple of American Western Hemispheric uh, countries that are in the OIC, uh, that there are things that are not covered by the OIC, but instead covered for those states by the Organization of American States, that that has like a common approach for uh, states in the Americas and the OIC doesn't try to to step in there. Similarly, for African Union states, there are topics that the OIC might weigh in on, but by and large, they let the African Union do what it needs to do, similar to the Association for Southeast Asian Nations and others as well. So this is not an exclusive thing. They have a limited scope of what the OIC does, and we're going to let you read uh, a bit of a history of the OIC and the mandate of the OIC and, and what it's uh, what it's about. Um, so um, this is why we picked the OIC is because of that self-definitional component and that will be useful uh, going forward. So where do you get the OIC member states? How many? Uh, so there's 57 of these. I'm about to review 56 that are part of the United Nations and one that's not. So the United Nations as an intergovernmental organization is formed in the aftermath of World War II. It, it is uh, launched in 1945. And in 1945, there were only a handful of independent Muslim states. The rest were colonized in one way or another, or part of larger countries that later broke up. So this would be the breakup of Yugoslavia, the breakup of the Soviet Union. We'll talk about those in a minute. But in 45, at the organizing meetings uh, of the United Nations, and these happened first during the World War II years, and then at a big organizing conference in San Francisco in 1945, uh, there were only uh, seven Muslim states present out of the original 51 states. So seven out of the original 51. I know this number here is 11 out of 60 because it takes us through 1950. So um, there, okay, so seven out of the original 51 were Muslim states. So Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Turkey were independent Muslim states. Now, they weren't all um, uh, religious states. In other words, later in the semester, we'll talk about the difference between a state that is Islamic and Islamic uh, uh, a republic. Um, Turkey, for example, strove very diligently to be uh, seen as a secular state where religion and the government did not uh, interfere with one another. Uh, but the populace was Muslim. And so uh, in this context, we'll call it, consider it a Muslim state. So those uh, seven were joined quickly by four others. And so um, about 18% of the global uh, independent states uh, in 1950 were Muslim. But one of the things the United Nations was committed to was to an era of decolonization. And what they were looking to do was to have the European powers and the United States divest themselves of the overseas colonial possessions that they controlled. And so this launches a process beginning in 1955 uh, of decolonization around the world, where these states, uh, primarily France uh, and uh, the UK, then followed by Belgium, by the United States, by Portugal, uh, and uh, uh, by the Dutch, and by a few others, of letting their states become independent. Um, and sometimes that was a very uh, peaceful process. So, for example, the picture in the top left-hand corner here is of uh, the, the last uh, person who, who represented the United Kingdom uh, in Nigeria, and the first independent Nigerian leader uh, walking uh, together at the transition ceremony. On the left is a ceremony, a peaceful transition between the Dutch and the Surinamese in Suriname in South Africa, I'm sorry, South America. But on, on the bottom picture is the Algerians fighting a, a, a brutal war uh, against uh, the French uh, to try and uh, break away a civil war and, and civil strife. So there's a real mix in here of, of how it played out. Uh, but in the era of decolonization, you had a gigantic leap forward in the number of states self-identifying as Muslim that are in the world. So where you had 11 uh, in uh, 1950, there's 48 in 1984. And that's 30% of the global uh, in, uh, states. So in 1950, it's, uh, it's a 18%. It goes up to 30% 
1984, which means that the Muslim states have a significant presence at the United Nations, which is not true in 1945 when there were 7 out of 51. So this brings us to the final sort of emergence of a number of new uh, Muslim states, and this comes in uh, a period that's known as de-Stalinization in some circles. So Stalinization referred to a process of making sure that the Russian homeland or, or motherland uh, that was at the heart of the USSR was surrounded by client states or buffer states so that if there had ever been an attempt to, uh, to, to attack Russia that the buffer states would sort of take care of that. Um, and it was about having a sphere of influence and integrating some partners and friends and allies into one larger whole. When that ends in the early 1990s with the end of the Cold War, a number of new states, particularly in Central Asia, emerge. Albania had come uh, to independence in 1955, sort of, and uh, it's a client state of the Soviet Union um, that uh, was was never in incorporated into the, into the larger whole, but had been a client state and was independent in 55. Um, and in uh, 1992, the Central Asian states become independent. So this gives us our current total, 56 states that are in the uh, OIC, remember there's 57 total, um, are also UN member states. So this takes us to 2011. 2011 is the last time a new state joined the United Nations. That would be South Sudan in 2011. So that's why the number stays there. 29% then of the global community at the United Nations uh, is Muslim. But there is another sort of main focal point of a lot of this, and that comes through this additional context that I would like to uh, show you here. So um, the additional context is this. There's 57 states in the OIC. There's 56 OIC states in the UN. The difference in number is Palestine. So Palestine is one of the most hotly debated uh, locales uh, in the world. Um, there's been some changes in how Palestine is treated internationally. Uh, there's a lot more uh, states around the world that are not Muslim states that recognize Palestine's right to exist or that it does exist separate from Israel, but there's still a preponderance of states that do not, that consider it uh, uh, part of uh, of Israel, either in a, a future singular state or a sing, uh, future two-state solution. But to the OIC, the, the representation of and promotion of Palestinian rights is a key question. And Palestine has the right to full membership in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. So you'll see that theme come up a lot uh, with the OIC, is what's the status of, of Palestine? Uh, for them, it's total equality. For others, there's a questionable status of it still. Um, in the UN, but only observer states at the OIC are these four. That's a little less relevant than the question of Palestine uh, because they're going to totally promote this. And these other four states are simply there to give the perspective of those, uh, of those Muslim communities um, in uh, meetings of the OIC. And this brings us to this question. These are the final thoughts on our region. So we've got essentially our definition of a religious focus in an IGO, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, as defined in the contemporary Muslim world. I've already acknowledged to you that there's problems with that. Um, for example, here on the Palouse, we have a mosque. Uh, and we have a number of uh, Muslims who are professionals, uh, who are uh, workers in our uh, communities, who might object to the idea that they're not part of the contemporary Muslim world. I would agree with them. I understand that's problematic uh, because we're, we're not trying to be exclusionary with this. We're trying to figure out, are there politics that are Muslim? I think you'll find that it's, that's much more complicated than that. Is there a culture that's Muslim? Is there uh, 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 a media that's Muslim? And using the OIC and its member states as the grouping gives us a chance to use those self-defining states in a way that permits us to have comparative conversations within the region and within the region and the external world. And it just gives us that sort of focal point that permits us to do that, which is not possible if we use any Muslim anywhere in the world. Uh, but I would say that um, your ability to engage with, uh, with Muslims in our own communities is an important one and one where you should be able to bounce ideas with them that you learn in this class off of folks uh, that you meet uh, in, in your life. So um, please uh, enjoy the readings and the, the short videos that go along with this unit um, and be in touch with Professor, Professor Afat Chow who can pass along questions to me if you have them and we look forward to seeing you later on in this class.